Hi there, guys. This is Vinay Chopra, another edition of the Apartment Syndication Made Easy. I hope you like, you have subscribed and given me five-star reviews on the book on Amazon, or you can get a free copy of this book in print as well as in audio. Go ahead and just go to apartmentsyndicationmadeeasy.com. That's all it is, apartmentsyndicationmadeeasy.com. Again, today's episode, it's a great one, and we got a great guest here, Matthew Ryan, is in the house. Actually, he started business in North Carolina in Charlotte, you know, and he lives in San Francisco in my backyard. I live in the Bay Area in Danville, Blackhawk. And it's so interesting that uh, Ryan, Matthew is right there. And we have meetup groups, thrive groups, a lot of things over here. We might meet, uh, you know, sometime. Uh, the big thing was also, Matthew, I was thinking about buying a hotel, a Marriott hotel at the Charlotte Airport. Charlotte oh, nice. Airport, brother. Yeah, when you, I saw Charlotte, I said, oh my gosh, you know, we didn't end up buying before COVID. This was 2019. And luckily, I didn't buy it, you know, with my partner. Yeah, you dodged a bullet there, my brother. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. That would have been a little bit difficult, you know, time. But yeah. let me share a little bit about Matt. Matt actually started with $95,000 in 2013, guys. Everybody listening and watching, I like to bring great guests who can you can relate to. And a lot of you are starting into multifamily, into all these different things and commercial space in 2013 and currently owns $4.5 million of real estate with another 2 million, that's 6.5 million in the phase two build up, build outs uh, via lot splits in the ground up residential. Uh, average IRR of approximately 22%, which is, as you know, time value of money, that's worth almost 24, 25 ARR, you know, the average annual return. Realized 1 million of equity invested. Uh, we have grown our construction pipeline to 5X and launched our Opportunity Zone Fund. We'll talk about that if you're thinking about Zone Fund. Also, something really intrigued about you, uh, Matt, was, is it okay if I call you Matt? Yeah. That's of course. You know, about green energy. And mm -hmm. that is a huge one. So we'll dig all into it. So stay tuned and we'll go right into it. Hi, Matt. Welcome, bro. So you're right there in the Bay Area and eight years in the Bay Area. I've been here 40, over 40 years, actually. And uh, tell me more about you and how did you get into real estate and so forth. And uh, talk about, I think, your superpower in green energy, why you got fascinated. You said something about your town or your state was going to uh, benefit from it. And that was a yeah. great cause to get into it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was... It was, I was at that point, I was searching for a career, not for a job, right? Yeah. Going back to, you know, whenever I left my family's business, I think this was in 2010. Um, I, I couldn't get hired. I worked at my father's company doing marketing. He kind of threw me into that department. I had no marketing background. Mm -hmm. I was trying to get jobs with agencies since 2010, 2009. No one's hiring, right? That, that's, that's the last place you're going to get a job. And so um, I'd always been passionate about the environment. Um, I saw what was happening through Obama and Secretary Chu at the time, who's the head of Department of Energy, this kind of large investment, not just in green energy, but in retrofitting existing residential commercial buildings. It was supposed to really revitalize the construction workforce. It was supposed to really be kind of our one of our core elements of how we drive local jobs in addition to, you know, kind of revitalizing workforce. And, you know, I said, man, this really sticks, you know, and to your point, I read that study. I had been uh, tinkering around with a couple of um, organizations, including the U.S. Green Building Council and reading this environmental study, you know, a 3% reduction would have in, in overall demand across the state of South Carolina would have, you know, mitigated the need for this very controversial coal plant. And I'm like, 3%, how, how hard can that be, right? It's just kind of an entrepreneurial mindset. And so I ended up going to a, a conference in DC, came back with, you know, met someone there. I said, hey, let's, let's do this. Let's start in residential. And I effectively just kind of thrusted myself into it, graduated from a few of the programs in South Face Energy Institute, which is really kind of a national leader in that segment. Um, and that's kind of what got started me in construction. So this was really just a very specialized trade in construction wow. that really helped me. I was retrofitting existing apartment buildings in yes. rural counties. Um, I was retrofitting commercial buildings with lights, you know, uh -huh. energy efficient lights. 
So um, I was helping homeowners solve moisture, humidity problems. Mm -hmm. um, we were helping new uh, custom home builders make their buildings more efficient and more mm -hmm. durable. You know, it was really a nice trade to get me into, you know, to I didn't realize I was going to be a developer at that point because it really threw me into a lot of different facets of construction and building and having wow. to tie it all together. And the kind of fundamental way you look at it is called building science. Yes. So comfort, energy efficiency, durability, and indoor air quality. Those are kind of- I love it. Work. I love it. And yeah, the yeah. efficiency comes, you know, uh, utilities bills going down, right? You know, yes. and then you have special, uh, you know, concessions maybe to the county also. And then maybe also some of the lenders look at it as a very favorable way yes. because you are becoming, you know, that's awesome. Awesome. And yeah. that led you to the new, new path. huh? Yeah. Yeah. And so I will actually, at the time I was still operating my construction company, I was starting to kind of get to the end of that road. The industry was looking a little rocky. Not a lot of people had scaled, you know, subcontracting organizations to the level that I wanted to get to. Mm -hmm. um, so I was looking, I was looking for something else. Um, I had a small pool of money that I had invested with a, you know, call it a stockbroker that, you know, did it as a favor to my yeah. dad. It wasn't a lot of money. Um, and I remember getting like a two and a half percent return yeah. you know, at that time. And I was like, man, this is what a joke, you know, like I just, again, kind of an entrepreneurial mindset. I said, I think I can do better. And my buddy had been hounding me. I had house hacked before, you know, so I was kind of yeah. familiar with the process, had bought a foreclosed condo in Charlotte and I found a foreclosed duplex uh, just right around the corner from me in an up and coming neighborhood yes. and invested in that, did all my energy efficiency, kind of green building yeah. things. Uh, I always joke that I made a one pager and gave it to my first prospective tenant. Uh, I was so enthusiastic, excited, but I met them that night. Hi, you are listening to Syndication Made Easy Podcast. We will be right back after this short break. Hi, thank you so much. This is Vinny Chopra and thank you for subscribing to my podcast and uh, YouTube channel and Facebook pages and all the great things and LinkedIn. Connect with me. I come live to you every Friday at 9 Pacific with Vinny and Bo Show. Please also look at that. And also the podcast, which is my uh, apartment syndication made easy. The book I wrote to a couple of years back became international top seller uh, on Amazon International now. And then we like to bring great guests for you every week or a, twice a week sometime to give you a lot of great knowledge. So please subscribe. You give us five star reviews on the iTunes the better the guests we can, you know, bring and our ranking will go higher also. Thanks again for uh, following us and really getting the most out of it. Please comment, like, share, because we would love to bring better and better material for you. At the place, and this was kind of still an up and coming neighborhood, and I didn't even have the power on yet. Mm. And I remember my friends laughing at me and making fun of me because they're like, dude, you took them to that property with no lights on, <laughs> you know? And I, I just so incredibly naive, right? But I was so passionate. And I think the people, you know, were, were kind of could feel that enthusiasm that I had for the product that yes. I had delivered, right? It was just a little, you know, 1800 square foot duplex. Um, but they saw that the, the time and energy that I put into it and they rented it from me, you know, the next morning. So it was a, it was kind of like the light bulb went off. I mean, the fundamentals on that deal to this day, it was like a 12% cash on cash. I think I hit like a 28 or 32% IRR once I sold. I love I it. Yeah, I tend to love, love it. Love it. I can just feel in your voice enthusiasm, yeah. you know, and let's <laughs> talk about that. I think yeah. that'd be a good one to talk about. I think, you know, myself also, I believe I'm, I've been, you know, portrayed as Mr. Enthusiasm or Mr. Smiles. I smile a lot, things like that. But you know what? It's so important to be excited about and how we present those ideas, whether they'll be accepted or not accepted by our customers or investors or broke anybody, right? So yeah. enthusiasm, tell me more about your personality a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, personality-wise, 
I think I've always been, you know, fairly kind of driven in, in my cause that once I find something, you know, it's pretty hard for me to, to let go of it. I've always been passionate about, you know, what it is, the things that I believe in. And then obviously, you know, kind of strong opinions. I always joke with people. I have, I had Midwestern parents, but I was raised in the South. So I kind of had this like wonderful hybrid of like being a very frank and upfront kind of blue collar mentality person, mm-hmm. with a little bit of, you know, a little bit of Southern, you know, touch. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the enthusiasm for me is, I just didn't know that I was going to become a developer. I just knew I was passionate about this industry. What I really enjoyed was pairing business with kind of these larger socioeconomic problems, right? So, you know, especially looking at, um, call it low income housing. We did, we did some retrofits on mobile homes Mm -hmm. where these mobile homes were out in rural counties in South Carolina and they were ha- they had utility bills sometimes of three, four, five hundred dollars a month. And if you've wow. ever bought a mobile wow. home park or tried this to invest in one, small, you know, like yeah, like mobile home parks, that's a yeah, lot of energy. Like four to six hundred bucks is like basically what those people would pay on a lease, right? Oh. And so we were going in there, and what was happening is these old heating units they installed 20 years ago is called electric resistance heat. They were the culprit, in addition to some really bad duct work that they just kind of come pre-packaged when they built these units. And mm-hmm. so we were going in there and we were retrofitting these these as part of a study through the utility program, a grant that we got awarded, um, you know, that we were actually like retrofitting and, and literally cutting these people utility bills in half. You know, and wow. so when you think about, you know, That's amazing. being able to, to feel passionate, not just about the trade that you're executing on, but the impact that that has on people, you know, that was, I loved about green building is it was really a great segue for me to understand, you know, energy consumption, how that not only affects people's upward mobility, right. Mm. But also where those buildings are located, how that affects upward mobility. Mm. And secondarily, just the overall condition of the home, the air quality, the comfort, you know, how that affects a person's life and how it affects their lifestyle. Oh and my for me, yeah, that really resonated and it touched. And so when oh, I got to just feel it in my side, <laughs> no, what you're Thanks saying you, is man. like cutting down the bill half that's more disposable income. Yeah, absolutely. Level. Yeah, I mean that's going to massively impact people's lives. Yeah, and so you know we've taken a lot of that when we focused on as I parlayed into revive, and there's a whole other story associated with that. You know, it was really workforce housing. That was what I liked. That was what moved me initially. Uh, the story of Miss Pam that kind of got me, you know, started and became the thesis of revive. And so we've really just been focused on workforce housing, and then trying to pair that, you know, uh, with. You basically just taking all the, the what I had and I learned in that trade and implementing that. We're not necessarily achieving certifications. You know, there's green building certification programs and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I think those are great. And I don't have an issue with them. Um, it's just like, you know, as an early developer that's trying to grow our business and really build, as you mentioned, um, you know, it, it's hard to have just that extra file and paperwork. So we've just kind of taken like a few key things, implemented them on our build side. And um, yeah, and, and that's just, you know, but back to your question, as far as the passion, um, you know, I just, I've always tried to pair business with what, you know, kind of a larger thesis and tackling a, a, what I consider to be socioeconomic, socio, socioeconomic issues, Economically impacting. you know, and for me, I think that's what, it makes it easier to get up in the morning, knowing that, or, that you feel connected to something, you know, that is a problem in society. And higher so, purpose, higher purpose. Yeah, yeah. I'm so happy. You know, Dylan Marma, a good friend of mine, he's been in mobile home parks, a lot of them. Actually, yeah. He just closed one $21 million worth. You know, I mean, he's into 200 million, something like wow. 300 maybe. And so several of them in North Carolina, South Carolina, in Florida, all over the workplace, you know. But this is very exciting for me to see how you could retrofit right there and yeah. save money and the quality of life. That's yeah. what I find, you know, if you get that niche where you are able to fulfill the need that's so, 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 so important. Like in my case, I don't know if you know, I've gone into senior assisted living quite a bit and memory. That's care. awesome. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, seniors are turning that 65 and baby boomers turning and then 70, 80, 90 years of age. So I think there is a big niche that we could fulfill. So let me ask you a question. So at this time, you are also doing the land sales and going through ordinance changes and all kind of run run us through some of your gambit there. Yeah. 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 So originally we we were going to focus on value add, you know, workforce housing. We pivoted into the, the co-living sector, you know, oh. which is a rent to bedroom model where people are sharing common spaces. Mm-hmm. We did that about 2019 and we've been, you know, just knuckle grinding on that industry for the last three years. 
Uh, we have two projects right now, one in Denver, one in Sacramento. Okay. Um, we're getting ready to do a phase two build out on our Denver projects. So we'll have another co-living you know, uh, facility right next door to the one that we're the old historic building that we're currently retrofitting in mm. Sacramento. We're also retrofitting a previously um, office that, that was residential converted to office. We're converting back to in residential. Denver, in Denver, That's in Denver, and then downtown Sacramento. Sacramento, uh, yeah, downtown. Sacramento is close to me, like hour and a half. Yeah, for you too. From yeah, Central. and that's where our other back. How how did it start, and uh, how big an yeah. area it is? And I'm very curious to see. Yeah, that. it really kind of started with my my good friend of mine, Tyler Kobik, who's who's an architect here locally. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he introduced me to a guy Ben Proven of Open Door, who was a co living operator, and you know, just meeting those guys and understanding the product. Um, mm-hmm. It was, again, it was one of those things I started peeling the layers back. I was kind of like, ah, co-living, that sounds like, you know, a bunch of hippies, Mm -hmm. you know, staying in a commune kind of thing. But then I toured Ben's facility in Oakland, you know, and a couple others. And I was, and I started digging into the demographics, you know, and I started realizing like, oh, there's 45 million Gen Zs who are going to hit the market over the next decade. You know, we're looking at the affordability crisis that exists, not just nationally, but within that particular market segment of 22 to 35s, you know, you look at job growth coming out of the 2010 recession, over a million, or excuse me, the majority of the jobs were created in cities of over a million people, right? Mm -hmm. So we're still, even though, especially in a post-COVID world, where there's a lot of talk about migration out of cities, but the fact remains is coming out of every recession, historically cities have continued to be large job producers Mm -hmm. and not just jobs, but high, high power, you know, high paying jobs. And so, you know, this housing that w- issue that we've had where cities, f- from my perspective, they really punted and missed their opportunity, you know, mm-hmm. to really, quote, revitalize urban cores. And now they're facing kind of this existential crisis with the office market. Yeah. Um, you know, housing still is still an issue. And yes. so I think we've really got an interesting time and opportunity to address that, um, you know, both within our cities, but also within a market segment. And to me, co-living really gravitated, you know, towards that big why and the addressable market. And then secondarily, when I first started in, in development, I was very interested in this idea of community revitalization and kind of this idea of that there's a lot of conflict between developers and the community at large. Mm-hmm. And that a lot of these revitalizing areas that are, you know, and this all this contentiousness around gentrification, I'm very fascinated by it. Um, and I think it's a very large problem that we as a society, specifically the United States, have to have to solve, right? And be better about solving. Mm-hmm. And it's really difficult because it, it, there's a lot of parties, right? There's a lot of people who are, are kind of wrapped around each other, both in the public and private sector. And, you know, going back to the co-living product, I thought that it was interesting that it really helped address deliver housing for a specific, you know, 22 to 35 demographic that was kind of being blamed for gentrifying these neighborhoods, Mm -hmm. which frankly, a lot of these young people are moving in these neighborhoods because they're affordable, not because they want to push a pressure of lower socioeconomic status out, Mm -hmm. right? They just are looking for affordable housing. And, you know, I look at the co-living product as kind of helping reduce competition. Because when we talk about gentrification, it's really competition for existing housing, right? Mm -hmm. Development, I always joke and I say, development only displaces ants, right? It only displaces worms in the ground. It doesn't actually gentrify or displace residents. But if we could deliver more more co-living product in these kind of suburban cores or areas of the urban core that would alleviate some of the pressure on the existing housing, Mm -hmm. you know, could we then alleviate some of the displacement that's happening and some of these seniors and some of these older members of the community being able to hold on to their housing because they're not getting pushed out from a younger generation who's looking for housing. And so that, again, there was a, like a very much a strong why behind the product in addition mm-hmm. to frankly, the returns and the addressable market and everything that's happening. Um, I still think we're at the, you know, in the chasm of adoption, we're still like right over here mm-hmm. in the living world. And uh, as evident today, open, or excuse me, um, uh, common, one of the largest property management operators in the country just merged with the largest European operator. Oh, so wow. you're seeing a massive consolidation. Graystar just launched their co-living brand that was quoted in the same Wall Street Journal article. Wow. So, you know, this is a market that is going to be is, is going to be an established segment of the apartment, you know, and, and has been kind of sputtering along for three years. And and frankly, I just think it's going to explode. And, and so I love it. Those love are kind it, of the reasons why we because, got because you know you know in the Bay Area it's so hard for young yep. people 
I mean, 800,000 is, I think, average price over here or something. How could you afford and the, also the down payment and all? Not only if the parents give you down payment, how about the job, you know, which will be yeah. to suffice well, to live? Yeah. Well, and whenever I moved to the Bay Area, I went through that problem. I did. Yeah. I did the roommate share interviews. I went through that process. Now I had a 115 pound dog. God bless her. She's she's in a better place now. She had a good 14 year run. But I went through all that awkwardness. I remember walking in the rain, like in Jan- January or February, thinking, yeah. what am I doing here? Like, what is it? You know, this is like, I've been looking for housing for 60 days. And I'm just, you know, hit after hit and just like, you know, I was very close to quitting and just kind of being like, man, this is not wow. the right place for me, you know, for whatever reason I stayed. But, you know, that shouldn't, seeking housing shouldn't be that complex. So right? And I was looking for a career at the time. I was really, I was taking a kind of a little short-term sabbatical in between leaving my contracting company. I was still in limbo about what I was doing. Revive was just an idea in my head, you know, so trying to balance job seeking plus housing, seeking housing, I guess shouldn't, sure. this shouldn't be that challenging, yeah. you know? And, and then I think we're, if we're going to alleviate that for the next generation so they can focus on the more important things and kind of get back to rebuilding this idea of what the American dream is in the next generation, you know, I think housing has to be a fundamental solution, not a problem for them. So true. So true. You just brought me my, my memories back when we moved here. We bought our first home for $99,000. <laughs> 99, three bedroom, brand new home, yeah. two story, brother. I couldn't believe it. 1,245 square feet, I think. And that's probably now 1.9 million. It's like, oh, it's more. crazy. It's yeah, crazy. a lot more than that, maybe even, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's the thing, too. It's like these guys, and I see these guys, these, these late stage, you know, millennials and Gen Zs, it may be that home ownership is out of the question for them, right? I mean, we're, we're seeing a substantial drop. All the projections are saying home ownership is going to continue to drop, you know, over the course of the decades. So we're yeah. kind of moving into this fundamental rental based market. Yeah. Um, Okay, if that's the case, and the American dream, you know, the the kind of pillar of building wealth was home ownership. What's going to replace that? These these kids are going to have to start creating or have a means of disposable income available yeah. to them to either save or invest earlier. Yeah. And if they're, if they're putting 40, 45 percent of their income into into just housing, we're we're breeding another generation of fundamentally poor, you yeah. know, people who don't have access to an ability for upward mobility. And I know that strikes home for, with you because you you are kind of that I've read your story. You are the American dream. Right. And I, <laughs> you talk about what motivates me. I saw my father go through the same thing, you know, a, a growing through his career and drive to you qualify and mega commutes. He did all that stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, so it also kind of resonates with me that you know, I think about it in a much more global context, which is what does the American dream look like for the next generation? Yeah. You know, and how are these, and, and, and how are we going to solve these problems to, to leave the pathway for people? Cause I think there's a lot of contentiousness about what that means, you know, what the, what the dream means to people and how, what it is to accomplish it. And I, you know, fundamentally I looked to buy a house here in the Bay a year or so ago, I ran the numbers, you know, it made much more sense for me to go and invest that money in real sure, estate, somebody uh, else make the money grow and then come back and yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I, you know, I think it's an interesting time to kind of reshape financial literacy and how people invest and how they do it earlier. But again, if they're if they're spending forty five percent of their income on rent, there's that's not even out of the question. It's mind boggling, mind boggling, yeah. literally, you know. And as compared to other parts, and you know, with the mobility and portability, we call it now job, right? You know, you yep. can work from wherever. I mean, a lot of people have moved away from the metro areas to more outside. I know, like where I live, Danville, California, the prices just went through the roof because yeah. a lot of people wanted to move from San Francisco, and that got the frenzy going where we are in in Black Hawk. I mean, just the prices are shot up in last three years, you know, but no, that's the nice. Let me ask you a question. A couple of things I ask, you know, like what kind of books are you reading now or what maybe one or two books have really shaped your thinking? You want to talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. Who not how is who not how right there. I right mean, there. as a matter of fact, we talked about it. Who not how is oh, an that's great. amazing book. And tell it me is. more about it. You know, I know yeah. I've shared that with my audiences before. Uh-huh. I mean, Dan Sullivan and Peter Diamandis, right? I, I I did their, or I listened to their Abundance podcast off and on, you know, kind of infrequently. Yeah. I always enjoyed 
you know, I think when you're listening and you're reading, you kind of want people to, you're kind of drawn to the people who speak very simplistically about things. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that's what I always loved about the two of them, Dan Sullivan in particular, is it's such a simple book. There's mm-hmm. nothing like, it's not mind boggling. This isn't quantum physics. And I love those books that kind of really shift your mindset. Like really it's sticky, right? Yeah. And that was what I loved about this book is it really stuck with me. And it was also very timely for me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I try to vary my recommendations of book and I would more give advice as like how to read versus what to read. Mm-hmm. And what I try to do is sometimes I'll be reading, I'll have four or five books that are quote open on my Kindle. Mm-hmm. And the nice thing about that is, even though it's kind of random is I'll tend to pick up a book when it's relevant to me. Yeah, exactly. So, even yeah, some so, pages I found, yeah. you know, sometimes you pick up a page, you're looking for some answer and there it is yeah, yeah. right there. <laughs> and, and and so we're in that moment now where I'm really starting to look at, you know, in real estate, you have a lot of third parties, a lot of vendors, contractors, people that work for you, but they don't, they're not your like W2 employees. And so we're really, you know, we're, we're up to, um, I'll correct you for just a second, because we're up to <laughs> soon to be about 12 million in assets under management, right? So oh, wow. Still very small. Thank you. Still very small, you know, still a boutique developer, but kind of hitting that, okay, now we've really got to scale the team. Yes. Um, and so that's what I loved about Dan's book is it was very relevant for me. It really made me think about the fact that this business is, if it's going to grow to the next phase, it's not going to be about Matt Ryan. It's going to be about who is in our team and who really yes. takes the vision forward. Mm-hmm. And I think as an entrepreneur, it's a really hard thing to let go of that, no matter what your phase or acceptance of it is. Yep. And I think the sooner you kind of see that and you can find a way to get people on board, you know, that kind of share that vision, which is frankly, like, it's not easy. You know, I'm five, six years into it. It's a process. Um, but it just made me really, it, it opened my up, so I, eyes a lot. And so that's kind of number one. The second one is I always love Howard Marks's most important, the most important thing. The most uh, important thing. Oh, right. The most important yeah. thing. Yeah. He talks a lot about, I mean, he's a, he's a famous bond trader. He's up there with the Buffets of the world. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the lesson that I always take from it that I try to share with everyone is, you know, in investing, it's always the things that you don't know that are mm-hmm. the most dangerous and the things that hurt you the most. And again, a very broad, simplistic statement, you know, almost kind of sounds like, oh yeah, sure, whatever. Mm-hmm. But when you really, when you're doing a deal and you're you're in your due diligence, you know, I, stu- I suffered from it. And I think it's maybe a good cautionary way to go, which is analysis paralysis, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you can overanalyze deals. And I think it's it's a good phase to go through yeah. um, because it's really, it, I think it helps you identify with those things that you don't know, right? It's like, yeah, this is the pro forma. This is what I understand about this deal, but let's flip the script and let's pretend as though I'm interviewing myself. You know, what do I not know? What do I, what, what are the things I always tell, ask people, what is the bogey? You know, what is the thing that's kind of lurking in the background that no one's seeing, that no one's paying attention to? Mm-hmm. And if you don't ask those questions and really take the time to kind of, you know, meditate on those things, you're going to miss them. And, and, and it'll funny when it happens, when that, that really negative thing or that, you know, that bogey comes out of, out of the shadows, you'll be like, man, I, re- I remember thinking about that, right? Or like, I remember I that small detail that it kind of popped in my head and I just kind of pushed it away, you know? And I think that's, in our business, you know, risk assessment and analysis, that's what we do, right? That is what keeps us in business. Sure. So um, those are kind of the two that I think are the most nice, nice. No, those are amazing books, both of them. And now before I let you go, I want to see in the background, I know you're a surfer, you're also into music, <laughs> right? Guitars. Yeah. So yeah, tell me more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm not a great surfer. It's, you know, this is San Francisco, so we're a little limited on storage. So it, it makes a good prop. So I will not claim to be a great surfer at all. <laughs> uh, you know, I joked with you, a struggling musician, aspirational musician for many years. You know, it's one of those good outlets, one of those things that I swear I'll get better at one of these sure, days. But, sure. uh, you know, it's really just kind of about a good place to decompress and yeah, every uh, once in a while, there's a little, you know, Maraca and yeah, yeah. lately I get my young kids down here and we we have a little jam session. It's kind of fun. Nice. Those are just the little things that we do. But yeah, I mean, outside of that, I'm a huge back back country, you know, camping. I just went skiing in Tahoe, you know, kind of an outdoorsman. 
Oh, um, lovely. I've always lovely. had a lot more hobbies than I've had time, which is good. Fabulous, fabulous. Uh, I know yeah. my co-host, uh, Bo Eckstein, we do a live show on Friday mornings, 9 a.m. Then I do Abundance with uh, abundance mindset with Vinny Chopra and Walter. We do it on Thursday morning, but we might be putting a big uh, bar over here, Ria Bar in San Ramon, I heard. Oh, wow. So maybe, you know, if you came there, I'll probably look that. forward to seeing you. I'll be speaker there and so on, yeah. you know. That's yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah. No, good visiting with you. And how could people reach you if, yeah. you know, as they're uh, getting great nuggets from you in this episode? Yeah. Yeah. Just head over to our website. There's a calendar link on there. You can schedule a time with me. Um, I think our, our direct line, reaching one of myself or our staff on there, we, we try to keep it pretty simple for people. Oh, wonderful. wonderful. Yeah, so just go to www.revive.com. Show notes also, yeah. No, thank you for your time. Really appreciate your hanging out with me and uh, not too far. I'm right here in Danville, you're in San Francisco. I know our daughter lives there. And it's, is it raining over there now? No. It was, it was absolutely pouring. Yeah. Oh, it was. Interesting yeah. morning trying to get around the city. Um, but yeah, it's, it, you know, hey, we will take the rain as much as we can. Totally. Right? Oh my gosh. California <laughs> rains where we live. Mountains are looking greener. And yeah. uh, as a matter of fact, our home in Blackhawk, we didn't have rain, uh, uh, electricity for three days from yeah. the new re, We were in candlelight and all. And oh, wow. uh, 3rd of January, the, you know, the electricity came back, but it's all part of life, you know, hey, Absolutely. it's okay. You know, Matt, hey, thank you, brother. Thank you for oh, joining me. For and me good luck to you with your all the end, endures, what you're doing. And, uh, you know, we'll talk again. Huh? Sure. Thank you, Vinny. Sure. It's a pleasure. Thank you again, you know, for joining Vinny Chopra this week on this podcast. And uh, please subscribe, share give comments and give five star rating if you can on iTunes because that really helps a lot for us to bring great guests and also iTunes raises our rankings up and uh, I hope you have been very happy with Vinny Chopra and team who are able to bring great information. If you would like to invest with us, please go ahead and go to vinnychopra.com slash invest. Thanks again. God bless you.